we're very excited today is um, Recovery Day. And um, so, sir, please um, come and um, thank you for um, coming today. We are the House of Resources. I do know that, Chairman Pugh, and, I, I, and I, I'm so grateful for you giving me a few minutes to talk oh, about it. Oh, no, that is absolutely uh, fine. And so that you know who we are, first of all, I um, want to point out the fact that Orca um, is a, <coughs> will be testifying. I mean, will be taping. That's fine. I know um, Orca. Oh, okay. That's fine. Um, Orca will be um, taping. And um, why don't we quickly go around the room so you know that you're not speaking to a room full of strangers. Thank you. Morgan McCall, it's a representative from Ludlow, Mount Holly, and Shrewsbury. Mm -hmm. Carl Rosenquist, I represent the town of Georgia. Sandy Haas from Rochester, also represent Bethel, Stockbridge, and Pittsfield. Mm -hmm. Oh, and Pugh, the streets of Seth Burlington. Barbara <laughs> <laughs> McFawn, I represent Barry Tom. Uh, My name is Teresa Wood uh, from Waterbury, and I also represent Bolton, Huntington, and Beals Court. I'm Dan Royce, I represent Belvedere, Johnson, Hyde Park, and Woolgate. Ah, uh, yes, I'm familiar with that territory. Okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, James Gregoire, Fairfield, Fletcher, and Bakersfield. Mm -hmm. Kelly Paella, Londonderry, Weston, Lynn Stratton, and Jamaica. It's a pleasure to meet you all, and I'm Bob Purvis, and I'm the director of the Turning Point Center of Central Vermont in Barrie. Okay. But most importantly, I'm a person in long-term recovery, which means for me that I haven't had to have, take a drink or a drug in 14 years and nine months. Nice. Congratulations. Yeah, that is not an applause line, but it's how we are taught to introduce ourselves to in order in our advocacy role to, to help reduce stigma. You know, we do get we do get into recovery, we do get healthy, we do become responsible citizens, and we do vote. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to have Jolinda LeClaire here this morning, and she's going to talk about, I guess, the last year, her report, but also probably a little bit about what she plans for this year. And uh, she plans a lot of big stuff for us, recovery centers, and we're hoping there will be a little bit of capacity building funding to go along with that. If we're going to double the number of recovery coaches in Vermont, that's going to put quite a burden on us, and one we will gladly take on. But we can use all the help we can get to build that capacity. I just want to say a few, maybe make a few remarks and interrupt me if you like, and we, uh, but I don't want to take too much time either. We, we, we have you here for 15 minutes. And that's no terrific. Um, but I would just point out one thing that the opioid crisis has taught us is that addiction cuts across every demographic mm -hmm. uh, that you could possibly imagine. And that uh, addiction is a human problem. We're finally understanding this after all the years of the war on drugs. And a human problem is also a human services problem. And as you are well aware, you know, the addiction issues are cutting across all of the departments and divisions that in the agency of human services. And uh, for example, uh, we've, for years now, we've had uh, the Lung Center and also DCF send us young moms with kids who are addicted to opioids to get some recovery coaching. Uh, and, and we're trying that now, working with Circle, we're trying to start, we're going to start a group for for young moms or people who have experienced intimate uh, violence to, uh, to have a healthy relationships group, you know, not to focus on the negative, but what, can you, what kind of relationships should you be hoping for and looking for in life, not to repeat what's happened in the past. Uh, those are a couple of examples, but um, I just want to mention a few things. There are two, a, two a, uh, departments within the AC Human Services that we do the most work with and who depend on us the most. Uh, one is the Department of Corrections. Uh, if you've, if you're, I noticed that uh, there are two, two representatives who at least are partly in Rutland, they're Rutland County there, so you may be familiar with Tracy Hopp, who is the director of the Turning Point there. She has done an incredible job with that Turning Point, and she, uh, she's done a, a fair amount of work with, uh, with the uh, Marble Valley Correctional Facility, and that led her to apply for a grant and to partner with the foundation that is doing the leading work with recovery services in, in, with incarceration, uh, which is the McShin Foundation. And uh, they, so she got advice from them, and she's partnered with them, and she's got this $300,000 grant. And so she is going to be, be revolutionizing, essentially, what recovery services for the incarcerated in Vermont. Uh, and this is, this is huge. Uh, so we will all learn from her. But this is an area where recovery centers are really having an impact, and we're going to have more of an impact as time goes on. We also, uh, through the Vermont Recovery Network, been working with Annie Ramisano. I keep having to pronounce her name. Yes, Ramisiano. And I know Annie, but I always call her Annie. I don't use her last name. And she's wonderful. 
and she's been pioneering the training of recovery coaches among incarcerated men and women, uh, in mostly in the north. Uh, and we've been our Vermont Recovery Network has been working with her on that, and we're hoping to build a bridge between uh, recovery coaches who are incarcerated, coaching other people who are incarcerated, to bridging them to the outside, so that so that they could partner with people who are on the outside, and kind of relearn those those living skills. Uh, for being a law-abiding citizen mm -hmm. again. So um, is that what's happening? Excuse me, I'm sorry to interrupt. No, that's what's right. What's happening in Rutland? Well, Rutland has is doing their own thing. They are much more intimately involved with the with the prison there. Okay. Um, and you can talk to the warden. He's they're really happy with what she's doing. That she goes in there. Recovery coaches have hours that they set hours that they go in certain days of the week, and inmates can sign up to be coached. Um, and uh, she also conducts groups there. And, and, think, then, and then when, if the, um, uh, when, when the individual leaves the correctional center, do they stay, yeah. if, they, if they're staying in Rutland? Yes. Is that? That's the goal, is to keep them connected with that coach they've been working with, and also to give them that warm handoff into the recovery center where they can get other kinds of support as well. Okay. Um, we hear a lot today about um, different types of professionals in the human services world being embedded within primary care mm -hmm. um, offices. And so do you work with primary care yes. docs? And, and how does, yeah. how does that relationship work? Well, in, in, uh, in my area, in Central Vermont, with uh, Central Vermont Medical Center and the medical practices that it owns, I guess, at this point, uh, there are a number of counselors, LADACs, who, um, who learned and who have learned the, the opioid addiction issues and who were expert counselors uh, in the, during the training period with that grant who are now embedded in some of the practices. And I know several of them. They are really terrific because what they can do is they can uh, they can pick up on the person when they come into the practice and connect them with other resources. So like she'll call me uh, to connect somebody from that practice to, to, to Turning Point. And I will often, with somebody who's maybe looking for a primary physician, will have that person contact her to uh, get a lead on what kind of, what doctor might be available for them. And, and, and if they're into practice, to, um, to collaborate so that the issues that person is facing don't end up causing problems for their ability to remain a patient in that practice. Because uh, the biggest problem we had with, with doctors prescribing Suboxone was that these, these people, the people who are on Suboxone are really not very stable in the beginning, certainly, and uh, they need a lot of support. And the genius of Vermont's treatment system is to provide a, a MAP team for every 100 patients so that the practice has, you know, has a team going in there who are, uh, they start off at the clinic, the hub clinic, and after they've been stabilized there, then they, they eventually are referred down to a, a primary doctor. But if they, be, if they destabilize, the MAT team is there to support them and get them back into the clinic and get them restabilized. So there's a couple of different ways that, uh, that the primary care <coughs> physicians are connecting with the treatment resources and recovery resources, too. So just briefly, um, we, at my turning point, we are part of the treatment court team, the Washington County Adult Treatment Court team. Uh, everybody who goes through the treatment court uh, ha is required to attend a six workshop series that we put on that's uh, called Making Recovery Easier. It's, it's designed to introduce people to recovery programs, specifically the 12-step programs, where you make it larger into what, what is the recovery process and what kind of recovery programs are available. Uh, and we also provide recovery coaching. Anytime the case manager for treatment court identifies somebody who's not connecting, and that's really generally the case. They don't connect with recovery groups quickly. Uh, we can, they can hook them up with a recovery coach who can be with them and be their anchor while they start asking themselves the questions about what am I going to do you know, as time goes on here. Um, and so the, that's been worked out very well. We're in, we're in the third year of a three-year contract with them for, for the Tre Treatment Court Enhancement Act project, rather, from SAMHSA. And I do know that, there, that uh, this is true in other recovery centers in other parts of the state. They're working with their treatment court teams to support people. Um, we also work with probation and parole routinely. Um, and they, uh, probation and parole agents will send people down to us, and they ask us to confirm attendance at different programs. We will not talk about what they say or do there, but we will confirm attendance. And so they have an avenue, they have a tool that they can use to see that the people that they're supervising are getting some kind of exposure to the kind of recovery supports that they need. 
we also work with the community justice centers and diversion uh, with COSA teams. Now, I can't be on a COSA team with somebody who might come to Turning Point because that doesn't, you know, I can't have confidentiality with that person. But, uh, but we do, and in fact, I am on the board of the Justice Center in Barrie, and, we, and I do recommend people who are in long-term recovery to become part of COSA teams, which is really important because, you know, the way the COSA process works, it's really important to have somebody on a routine basis every week there who understands what that person is trying to do and to provide a little bit of guidance now and then uh, for them and, and to connect them with recovery resources. Not everyone may know COSA. Pardon me? What is, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. COSA stands for uh, uh, Circus of Support and Accountability. And um, there, there's generally three volunteers plus a staff person who meet with an inmate. Well, an inmate comes out into the COSA program. They, make a, they enter into an agreement for one year to engage in all the services that they're recommended to engage in and that they do what they're supposed to do to get on their feet and, and get, get work and find a place to live and so forth. Um, and some of, the, some of the, cent the justice centers also have residential COSA. So they, also, they have apartments that they can rent to, to people coming out into COSA for a period of time until they can get their own place. Um, and have to be able to pay rent, uh, but the, they meet weekly. If you, there's a movie, new movie out, uh, uh, Coming Home. Bess O'Brien did it. It's great. It's a terrific. It gives you. That's a movie that I recommend you see because it'll give you a good flavor of how Coastal works and the fact that this is just a point in time. You know, the guy from Central Vermont who's in that movie, um, Jake. Uh, at the end of that movie, he wasn't in a really very good space, but after the movie was over. He came out again, and he's now working full time, and he's supporting his 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 wife and their child. So uh, nobody makes it the first time, you know. But, but eventually, if they keep at it, they, they will get on the right track, and that's happened with Jake. And the COSA team really is helpful because what it does, the COSA team serves to to represent the community to bring that person back into the community, you know, instead of just up here, you know, good luck. It's we're part of the community. We want you to become part of the community again, and we're going to be here with you every week, and we're going to take you to breakfast now and then, and take you to a show or something, and uh, we're going to help you get there. So uh, that's what COSA is. Um, so, uh, Mr. Curtis, we have um, two minutes. Mm -hmm. So what would you like to leave us Okay, with? I, what I'd like to leave you with is that uh, everybody comes asking for more money. I know that. Um, we finally, after four years of level funding, got a little bit of an increase this year, to which we're very grateful. But uh, the fact is that all the different agencies are increasingly putting demands on our services, and we haven't really been keeping up with that. You know, it's, it's hard to keep up with that with our capacity. So we we really, really would be grateful for a little bit of increase in our in our basic grant, so we can enhance our capacity to serve all these different agencies that are now sending people to us. So that's my message, and also to thank you, because the legislature has been good to us, and we appreciate the support that you've given us. And, uh, and and we'll support. We'll appreciate any further support that you might have for us. <laughs> so thank you very much for listening thank to me. You. Thank, thank you. you. Thank for, you. Uh, and congratulations. Well, thank you. Um, and thank you for the work that you do um, in Barry and the advocacy. Thank you. Thank you. Farm to school. Farm to school. Yep. Um, Betsy, over here. Hi, Betsy. Please. Um, today is um, a, a recovery day. Today is also farm to school day, and um, oftentimes, if we are able, we try to give groups um, that are coming into the state house that are related to issues, that policy issues, or topics are in this committee, we try to get folks, even if we don't have a bill in front of us, 15 minutes. Well, thank you. Um, we can speak quickly, and I have a few handouts maybe I can pass around. The second one. Um, so my name is Betsy Rosenbluth. I'm the project director of Vermont Feed, which is a partnership, a farm to school partnership of Shelburne Farms and the Northeast Organic Farming Association of Vermont. And I coordinate the Vermont Farm to School Network, which is has almost 500 members, teachers, educators, farmers, food service directors across the state, um, all advocating for healthier local 
food in school meals, and food, farm, and nutrition education. Um, and first off, I just want to thank uh, you for your support last year, expanding Farm to School to more schools and early childhood programs. So it was just, what, a year or two ago that uh, we passed the Rosa McLaughlin Farm to School bill that updated the original legislation that expanded the program to early childhood programs. And so we have um, uh, Beth Miller, who will be joining us from Rutland in a minute, to speak after me, um, to talk about how that the difference that that expansion has made. Uh, the grants have gone to 105 schools and 39 early childhood programs already, supporting um, farm to school. And I think unique in Vermont is the program also integrates food access into farm to school. And so 76 schools now have universal free breakfast and lunch, which really changes the culture of the school. It takes away that stigma that distinguishes who can pay, who cannot pay, um, and it really makes healthy, nutritious food part of the school day, just like textbooks, just like laptops or what other tools that kids need to be able to focus and engage in learning. Um, as you imagine, many Vermont children get a majority of their daily nutrition through the school meal programs with breakfast, lunch, and after school snacks. Um, it's really critical. And for the littlest ones, age zero to five, 70% are cared for outside the home. And so good nutrition is really, really essential. 90% of our brains develop by the time we're five. And so Farm to School is really helping um, providers to work towards better nutrition, integrating it into helping them achieve what they need to around licensing with the regulations and really supporting that to happen. Our goal for Farm to School is 500,000 a year in state funding so that we could achieve the network goal that 75% of our schools have integrated food system education and nourishing meals, purchasing 50% of the food, there's about $16 million in food that schools purchase every year. So we would like that to be a market opportunity for Vermont farmers, um, and we're hoping that eventually we'll get to 50% from regional and local sources. Um, the program is really um, desired. We did a survey of early childhood providers, over 90%. Um, really were interested in professional development around farm to early care. And we know that schools as well are hungry for the kind of support <clears throat> that they're getting through the farm to school program. And just a couple of quick health uh, points. You know, establishing healthy eating habits early in a child's life is giving them that gift for the rest of their life. And it's really critical for preventing the kind of diet-related diseases that we're seeing. 26% of Vermont high school teens are still obese and overweight. And that leads to some of the chronic uh, problems, health problems, later on. <coughs> You might remember Department of Health has said poor diet is one of three behaviors that accounts for over half the deaths in Vermont. And so Farm to School is a really strong prevention strategy for trying to reverse that trend. Um, just one last point. We still, over 17,000 Vermont children come from food insecure homes, one in seven. And so even though we're moving in the right direction, we still have some work to do. Um, so serving healthier local food, and what we have found and that you see in the handout is serving local healthier food, connecting kids to that food, increases participation in the school meals program, which in turn gives those school, me school meal programs better finances for buying more local fresh food, which again increases participation. We call it the virtuous cycle, where this positive reinforcing cycle that happens. Um, so we hope that you'll consider increasing. Even a small amount makes a huge difference for early childhood programs and for school communities. But increasing farm to school in the budget this year, we can put it to good use immediately. Um, and thank you so much for giving us uh, your time this morning.
Okay. So, Kate. before you we have questions for you. So okay. Yeah. Absolutely. That's okay. I'm just curious about how you get to be one of the schools that's providing. I'm just looking at the list. Yeah. Said, how do you get to be the 77 for? Uh, with universal free meals. So right right now, well, there's a, several ways to do it without getting into great detail, but we're happy to come back. So there's a federal program or a couple, community eligibility provision, provision two. There's ways that um, if you have a higher percentage of lower income qualifying children in the school, then you can apply for that through the federal program. And that's what we have been doing through the Farm to School Grants Program and Technical Assistance is Hunger Free Vermont has been working with schools to help them qualify so they can access those programs. And once you qualify, then the entire school moves to universal meals. What we found, and uh, Ginger Fair knows here if we want to get in great, more detail, um, is that some other schools that aren't quite at that point um, are really interested in moving towards universal meals. So there's, I can send um, you a link to, there's a great story in Westminster recently on WCAX that the school themselves found that paying that difference um, to provide universal meals for all children, not just those that are individually eligible, um, was worth that investment. They're sort of doing a pilot. And there's, what, a handful, three, four, it's growing the number of schools that are saying, well, even though we might not qualify for that federal program, we think that investment, the return on that investment is worth it. So we're hoping to see that just continue to spread. So the provision two, which is the... the Excuse me, I appreciate the, um, when you are in there, sorry, the only person who can talk is the person at the end. I apologize. Um, if you are speaking next, or when we open it up, if we can. Can I just ask a question? Yeah. So uh, on the on the grants that you give out, mm -hmm. are they like one-time grants to get the school going in this direction? Because it doesn't seem like you would have sufficient money with five hundred thousand dollars to sustain that to all the schools that you give grants right. to. Right. Um, well, a couple of things. One is the grants are a really important, critical piece of a larger effort of farm to school. So there's many, many more private contributions and businesses who are supporting a lot of the schools and the support organizations. So the grants are just one piece of that larger puzzle to support schools. Um, second, it's a two-year grant, and with the grant funds, they get an array of support services. So they have Hunger Free Vermont working on their school nutrition program. They have curriculum integration workshops. They have um, action planning workshops. They have um, folks coming in and working with you know, everything from local purchasing to cooking from scratch. So it's a really intensive investment, all with the intent that at the end of those two years, you embed that program in the school so it becomes the way that the school continues. If the school isn't ready, then there are other workshops and a lot of support organizations and courses that can continue that support. Okay, thank you. Captain. Um, I noticed when I looked at the list that the Barrytown school system is not on it. But I, I, my grandkids go there, a set of them do. Okay. And they get meals. Yeah, I mean, yes. So what are they in? The schools get meals right now. I mean, um, they, they feed the kids in the morning. Yeah, breakfast, come. yeah. Um, I would say Hunger Free Vermont is better to get into the details of the school meal program. If you'd like Ginger to respond, we can we can do that. Um, in the way we work with Coke, you would like to phone a friend. Okay. <laughs> Ginger, could you respond to um, and you could this example and right. introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, my name is Ginger Fairnote, Nutrition Initiatives Manager for Hunger Free Vermont. Um, Barrytown School uh, doesn't qualify for universal meals because of the percentage of children that attend the school that are low income is not high enough. Um, but they do offer uh, breakfast, lunch, and after school meals. Right. Um, and the children that are eligible to receive free or reduced meals receive 
meals for free. Well, so it was I, I, I know that my, my grandkids get them, and, and I don't think that they, they're going to qualify under the poverty guidelines. But they eat. I know they do. Yeah. And I'm glad they do, too. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's great for the kids, they, you know, socially and everything. Yeah, really important. Okay, so um, Kate Venn is with Food Connects, working with the schools in the southern part of the state. She'll speak, and and then Beth is in Rutland. And Logan, do you have a piece of paper, or um, Kelly, do you have a piece of paper so that you could write down your name? And um, you could write down the name and correct spelling of the um, person from Hunger Free Vermont. And as you come up, if you could write down your name and your, where you're from, because we don't have that list, and you, this is a public record and a public meeting. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi. Welcome. Thank you. So I'm Kate. Um, I'm here today from Brattleboro. Um, and I work for Food Connects, which is sort of a regional. I'm sorry, Kate, Kate who? Uh, Kate Venn. And I do have, um, I have sort of an expanded testimony that I typed Perfect. up. That I, can, I only have five copies, but I'm That's sure that will um, go. We will give one to our committee. Um, Great. Thank you. Assistant. Um, so we, so Kate Venn, Food Connects, we are a farm to school, sort of like a regional farm to school support organization based in Brattleboro. And we work with schools in mostly Wyndham County and then a few schools, mostly the, um, the Springfield School District in Windsor County. Um, and I, um, I probably work specifically with about 25 schools at this point, and that's both elementary, middle, and high school. Um, and I'm here today to share a little bit of information about a new initiative that we are piloting in partnership with the Brattleboro Town Schools, which is um, three elementary schools in Brattleboro. Um, and that is exploring the connections between the farm to school and the trauma-informed approaches. Um, and I'm sure many of you have heard a bit about um, the trauma-informed schools movement, but um, for those of you who haven't, um, many schools across the state and the country are working to become trauma-informed, so sort of building their own capacity um, to better support students who might be experiencing trauma at home. And we are looking specifically at um, persistent food insecurity and how that relates to student success and well-being. Um, so we're really excited. We're going to be working for the next two years with some grant funding that we received um, with the Brattleboro Town Schools to explore kind of how the two approaches align um, and help them to find ways to use farm to school interventions to build resiliency amongst their students. Um, what's really cool about it is we work with a lot of schools, but as I'm sure you know, school folks are really, really busy. And so to find ways to integrate into programming that's already happening, I think can like really reinforce the farm to school. Um, approach. And so um, I don't want to say too much, but the two kind of um, specific interventions that um, we are thinking about, um, the first has to do with community connectedness. So that is really a big piece of both the pharma, the farm to school and the trauma informed approaches. Um, we do a lot of work around school gardening and fall harvest suppers, and those two things kind of go hand in hand. So often schools are growing food in their school gardens, teaching students, using that as a tool for teaching, and then actually using that food in feasts or harvest suppers in the fall with families. And so we're going to be trying to work with the schools to kind of expand um, those two pieces as a way to increase community connectedness and bring families together to get to know each other and hopefully to be able to get to know some of the um, farmers that are growing food. Um, and then the second, um, the second piece is around the cafeteria, of course, such a big part of farm to school. Um, and so we'll be working with teachers, food service, administrators to kind of understand the connections between food and nutrition and student well-being. And so working with them to make cafeterias and those spaces where students are eating feel inviting, approachable, fun, welcoming, all of those things, um, and also sort of reflective of student voice and choice so that students are really engaging in school meal programs and feeling like that is a space where they can have their needs met at school. So will you be doing anything with child care centers? Um, at this point, no. Okay. I would say it's really, we haven't framed it as a pilot, but it kind of feels like a pilot. Okay. Um, and so we and, have. And I'm sorry, you have one minute. One minute. Quite, um, okay. Um, we have a lot to learn. So I guess the last thing I want to say is just um, look us up. We're going to be trying to share this story over the next two years as we kind of explore the alignment between the two. Um, and so you have my information. Thank you.
And we have Beth from the Rutland Parent Child Center. Can she take one minute? She can take one minute. You are given, all groups are given 15 minutes. And, and so you now have, uh oh, 45 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> I do, do you have a copy of okay. actually several copies of my testimony? Well, and you know, do you know what the wonders of um, of doing is that this will be up and available for the entire public and Perfect. the entire world mm -hmm. to see on our legislative webpage. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I um, have a, a written testimony that, mm -hmm. given my nervousness, I would have. Um, and you can really take deep breath. Well, but it's four and a half minutes long. Well, <laughs> <laughs> okay. So. Um, am, am I good with this? <laughs> okay. So I represent uh, Rutland County Parent Child Center, which is an early education site, and I know that you had a question regarding you know the impact that farm school is having on the um, early childhood centers and so I'd really like to speak to that um, so um, the food security and adequate nutrition are two challenges to many of the families in Rutland County so I am coming from Rutland County but it's indicative across the state according to hunger free Vermont one in seven children live in food insecure homes over 90% of the families served through our programs at Rutland County Parent Child Center are living at or below the poverty line. Access to nutritious meals can often be difficult. So even though some, uh, there are also many families, as you spoke to, that are not living in poverty um, that at our at Rutland County Parent Child Center are also actually offered free meals just to keep the social atmosphere actually very equal. So um, these problems, food insecurity, inadequate nutrition, and hunger are all adverse childhood experiences, the, the trauma that was just spoken of. Um, thus trauma impacts physical and emotional health as well as behavior and academic performance. The effects can stay with a the child their entire life and continue generationally unless steps are taken to break the cycle. At Rutland County Parent Child Center, we're really committed to breaking those cycles in all our areas. So to address the issues of inadequate nutrition, hunger, and food insecurity specifically, uh, the, the Parent Child Center has begun to implement a strong and multifaceted food program in our community, enhancing the 3,000 plus meals per month at our educa early education sites. This initiative is greatly enhanced through the Farm to School and Child Nutrition grant we were awarded through the Agency of Agriculture, Food, and Markets. Through the state's growing farm to school and early childhood efforts, Rowland County Parent Child Center will have the opportunity to develop a well-structured, well-planned, and well-integrated food program within our early childhood education. The Farm to Nutrition <laughs> Grant will help us to dramatically transform what is an ex the existing food service, which we would say is mediocre, to one that will be exemplary by using more locally sourced ingredients and by bringing food and nutrition directly into our classrooms. It is here in the classrooms and in the cafeteria that we can begin with the child to reset an expectation of healthy eating for themselves and then eventually within the family. All this requires a well-trained and enthusiastic staff and team of professionals committed to helping them. The team built through the Farm and School Program uh, and Child Nutrition Grant provides the, those resources. Our own professional uh, staff is excited to be part of this team, helping the children they care for shift the paradigms to make long-lasting changes in their lives. Bringing locally sourced fresh food and nutrition into the classroom and involving kids in hands-on integrated food practices creates interest and acceptance of new foods and balanced meals. These ideas come home to the parents through the natural excitement and curiosity of children, causing transformation within the family meals at home. Vermont schools with farm to school programs have reported two times the national average in vegetable consumption, and we are expecting the same. With farm uh, to school, uh, with farm to school and early childhood, we will be growing our partnerships within the broader community by bringing the farm sector into our educational programming. It's exciting to think of our children knowing who is growing their apples, how their potatoes are grown, and where in, Rutland, in the Rutland County community these farmers work and live to grow the salad on their plates. Knowing the farmer gives added import to the food. Knowing the food gives added import to the farmer. Vermont is fortunate in that we have so many individuals committed to working the land and creating a healthful food system. Introducing children to this health, healthier, fresher food system through cafeteria, classroom, and community will help them to understand some of the strongest values held by Vermont in a comprehensive way. The benefits of a farm to school and early childhood program are having positive effects across a broad spectrum of needs in Vermont families. Introducing the program to early childhood settings is brilliant and catch where it catches children and their families at a time when crucial lifelong patterns can be remade. 
So I would ask for your support um, for the uh, keeping the funding level at 231,000 uh, for the fiscal year and working towards the program's goals of 500,000. So thank you for your investment in the children's future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can, can you have a question? Can what do you do in the winter? What, what do we do in the winter in yeah, terms of the farm the to school? Um, so we currently, we just received the grant for a farm to school. Right now, uh, we are working through Cisco and we have canned goods and, you know, it's really, uh, it feels impoverished to even talk okay, about so it. That's local. Not local food, that's so that's not local food. So that's not local. We will be moving um, into local food and there's a lot of um, uh, food that is able to be put into the system, the, you know, the parsnips and carrots and turnips and potatoes, all the onions that are um, over overwintered um, through, by, by the farmers and by that we work a lot with the food bank too and the food bank helps to provide a lot of those um, you know like root crops throughout the winter and you all will be here all day today uh, yes okay so if we have questions in terms of our particular area or, um, what's happening in terms of the child care centers in our area or just even though schools and education is not the focus of this committee, but rather early childhood, if you're interested in why your school is or is not in there, folks will be around all day. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank, Thank you. you very much. And we have a celebration from 4 to 6. Mm -hmm. If you want to join us in the cafeteria. Yeah. Oh, Thank Great. you very much. Thank we you. will be otherwise mm -hmm. occupied. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think this slight might be Bob Purposes. Who? Um, oh, the, the first, first, first person who testified. Oh, okay. Who um, was could you, um, could you turn it off? Yeah. And um, could you email, um, what's his name? The first guy testified. I just thought it was, oh, no, it was oh. just below the desk. I oh, okay. I think it's the first guy that testified. Okay. Um, I'll email. So, Turning book, yeah. whatever. Yeah. Um, Turning book. Yeah, okay, everyone, let's take a deep breath and um, welcome um, Mr. Marshall. Yes. Is that how you pronounce it? Yes, Marshall. Um, yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Ann Pugh from the House Human Services Committee. And, um, committee as the agenda says we have moved on to um, a different topic and we're um, talking again about um, H57 um, and um, Mr. Marshall thank you for coming and so that you have a sense of um, we don't all have to say the what town we're from um, <laughs> but if, just so that you know who you're speaking to um, right. Kelly Bayalis I'm James Gregoire Dan Noyce Teresa Wood Chapman McFarland and Pugh, Sandy Hawes, Jessica Benson, Carl Rosenquist, Mary Beth Redmond, Logan McCall. Um, and, and committee, um, uh, Mr. Marshall is the um, husband um, of a woman who went through an abortion late um, in her pregnancy. And he is here to um, share their story because people had questions um, around um, who is it that makes these decisions and what are these decisions about. Thank you. Thanks for having me here today. Um, my name is Garen Marshall. My wife and I are patient advocates now for later abortion access after our experience with it. Um, I We actually live in New York, um, and we're just in New York, um, although I went to school in Vermont. So. Um, but I... Uh, wanted to come here today to share our story because I, I feel like there's a lot of rhetoric and hypothetical situations that are being talked about uh, sort of on the national stage um, and around specific pieces of legislation across the country. Um, a lot of these hypotheticals don't reflect our story. They don't reflect any of the stories of, of the large community of patients that we know through uh, support networks and things like that. Um, so I think it's very important that we introduce a little actual patient perspective into the conversation whenever possible. Um, we, uh, so our, our first pregnancy ended in a miscarriage at 10 weeks, um, and then we were excited going into our next pregnancy, uh, a little trepidatious, but excited. Um, and. Uh, you know, sort of, you st it starts becoming about deadlines. Once we hit that 10 weeks, we were like, maybe we're going to be okay. Um, 
And then around uh, 16 weeks, uh, just some little subtle indications um, started becoming apparent. Uh, an anatomy scan showed uh, clubbed feet. Um, a little bit later, we got uh, there was a, a blood test that um, detected a high fetal protein level, um, and and that that can have some that can indicate some pretty terrifying uh, outcomes for pregnancy. So we were scared, and and suddenly we were elevated to a, a maternal fetal health specialist, um, and so we were getting ultrasounds like every two weeks, um, every time waiting for. Uh, terrible news, but it kept sort of just being pushed off. This this thing happened. We had, there, were the, there were clenched fists, um, things like that. But um, we understood that as long as growth was progressing, um, we would be okay. So we we sort of just crossed our fingers and and kept going. Um, eventually, at 30 weeks, we went in and we found out that growth had had cratered, and that. Um, there was, there were high levels of amniotic fluid, and um, we didn't really know what that meant because we're not physicians. Um, but our doctor explained to us that that meant that the the fetus uh, couldn't swallow, um, and swallowing is how a fetus practices breathing effectively, um, and that indicated that uh, if if we we're able to carry the pregnancy to term and get through a birth um, that the, the baby would not be able to breathe outside the womb. Um, so, you know, like anyone in a, getting bad news from their doctor, you sort of look to your doctor and you're like, okay, well, what do we do about this? What do we do now? Um, and that's when our, in our case, in, due to the New York law, our, our, our doctor informed us, um, you know, that he couldn't really help us. Um, and if, if, you know, we could, we could carry the pregnancy to term, but he didn't recommend that. Um, my wife had had a brain surgery the year before, and if she went into spontaneous labor, it could risk her life. Um, and he, he recommended that we seek a later abortion, and there's uh, four places in the country that you can, you can do that as a sort of like coming from out of state. Um, so we went to Colorado. Uh, in our case, uh, because of the, some specific health issues, um, we had to pay $10,000 out of pocket, which we didn't have. Uh, my, my wife's mother took it out of her retirement account. Um, a lot of patients that we know through our network pay anywhere from twenty dollars to $30,000 for the procedure. So you can imagine that this means that a lot of people can't get the procedure. Um, and then we um, mourned, frankly. Um, we, we had a loss. And, and I think that, that that basic story of, of you know, wanting something, um, having some hope, holding on to hope, and then finding out that, that there is no hope uh, is, is more like all of the stories that I've heard from every patient that we have talked to and met than anything being talked about in the news. Um, and I know that, that it feels like there's a lot of charged rhetoric on both sides. But again, you know, the, the patients that, that have talked to us, we, we put up a, a letter, a public letter, an open letter um, yesterday signed by, I think it's up to 85 people who have actually had um, abortions after 20 weeks. Um, People, once we once we put the letter out and put the word out in our community of people that could sign on to it, um, people started writing us and sharing their stories. Uh, these are stories of people who had a very wanted pregnancy, went in, and you know, one woman was getting her teeth cleaned, and it introduced something that uh, an infection that ended up um, causing her pregnancy not to be successful and threatened her life in the process. Um, Cases where a toxin was introduced in someone in someone's environment, and it, it led to some terrible things. Um, a lot of cases where there's, you know, it's important to understand pregnancy is very complicated, and each each person's sort of trajectory in pregnancy, their health conditions, the circumstances around their pregnancy are very unique, and a lot of a lot of people like us don't find out till very late in pregnancy that something's gone terribly wrong. Um, 
the truth is we don't know a lot about, um, that there's not a lot of data on pregnancies or t abortions this late in pregnancy. Um, the CDC only collects information um, that, that sort of captures it post 21 weeks. Uh, but, the, but we know that like at the later and later you get, they fall off rapidly um, to the point where like, all, frankly, a lot of the best information that we have is anecdotal. So um, my wife is in a support group for people that have had to end uh, wanted pregnancies, but through, through telling our story publicly, we have met people from all over the country over the last two years um, who've had to go through these procedures. And, and I, I, I can guarantee you that they're your neighbors, they're your family, and they are terrified to talk to you about it because of the rhetoric in this country. So, um, The reason that we have a wide network of patients that have had to go through this. Um, I'm, I'm sorry to say that we, we were not able to bring anyone from Vermont. Um, as you can imagine, a lot of people are very unwilling to share this story, even with the closest people in their lives. So um, I can't speak for every patient uh, that's gone through this, but I think, I think we can speak for a lot of them now. So um, I'm very willing to answer any questions you have, Paul. I don't have a question, really. Yeah. I just have a comment. I want to, um, at least from my perspective, help ease your mind. Um, I think I speak for everybody in this room. None of us, no matter how we feel about the issue, um, wants to limit um, abortion in cases of medical necessity like that. Um, I realize there's rhetoric on both sides that, that are extreme, but I feel confident uh, speaking and saying none of, none of us feel that medically necessary um, abortion should be illegal. But, um, and I also want to have my sympathy to you. I know from my own experiences, my, my ex-wife, uh, we lost our first child, and she almost died. She had been rushed to the hospital. Yeah. So I understand that. And, yeah. and so, um, you know, thank you for sharing that story. Yeah. I know it's not easy to do. Yeah. Thank you. Um. Can, I, can I just, a point of order, that we speak for ourselves yes, and not on behalf of everyone? Okay. That'd be great. <laughs> okay. You, you kept using the term we, mm -hmm. and I was trying to, did, did we mean you and your spouse, or did we mean some organization that you represent? Uh, you kept saying we have many patients, we have many. Uh, uh, we and, we and, me and my wife. Um, we, we, she, she and I, <laughs> since, um, since sort of going public with our story, have been just, again, like not on behalf of any organization, um, just trying to share our story with people and share other stories with people, and frankly get um, get patient perspectives into things like news coverage and stuff like that. Um, but I, I don't represent any organization. My follow up question is, do you find that you run into people who, um, are still against uh, an abortion that would be that that would take place because of what you just talked about. Yes. Do you find people that, that feel you shouldn't do it anyway? Yes. So they they so they're willing to let the woman die. Yes. There there uh, there are a lot of people um, in this country that we've talked to who feel that. Um, that a pregnant person should give their life, even in a case where uh, the pregnancy is not viable. And a lot of that, a lot of that comes from the idea that you know abortion is just wrong. Um, but I, but I think that, that that idea is is more of a cultural idea. I don't think it's I don't think it's been tested by people's experiences. Um, and more often. Uh, people who are against abortion, uh, if you if you tell them someone's story, <clears throat> whether it's our story or similar stories, even stories where there's not a medical indication, I mean, we've I could I could tell you some really terrible stories about about um, you know a, a 12 year old who was raped and who the pregnancy was not discovered until later in pregnancy. 
Um, and and you know, I, I think I think we could go through it and say like, okay, we're okay for it in, in a medical circumstance. We're okay for it <clears throat> in situations of, of rape or this or whatever. But I think what happens is that we start drawing these little lines around people, and we say it's okay in this case, it's okay in this case, it's okay in this case. And my my challenge is is that I think that it's very difficult for a law to sort of draw those lines in a way that we would all all agree with. Um, I think it's. I think it's. I mean, I, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a physician. But um, my guess is that the people in the room, the patient and the physician, who has gone through you know medical training and licensure and all that kind of stuff, are in the best are in the best position to make that decision uh, with all of the factors, all of the complicated factors that that might be coming into play. Um, I, th I think once we start trying to draw these lines, we can be sure that someone's going to end up on the other side of it, and that is a tragedy. That person you might be sentencing to death. That person you might be sentencing to a life of incredible hardship um, with an, an unresponsive baby that will never, ever, ever have any brain function, for instance. That's something that's happened a lot. Um, these, these situations where people find out that there's some terrible indication, they don't want to get an abortion. They don't believe in abortion, so they may they may they may continue the pregnancy, and uh, you know either to full term or or have an have an induction earlier, and they go through a mourning process um, where where the baby expires in their arms, and that that's something for instance that that would be disallowed by some of the laws being proposed um, from people in the country. Um, and, and those, those people are going through grieving processes, and their physicians are being very compassionate and allowing them to do that. And I, I think, again, those, those are the stories that are, that are actually happening in the country. So I think if, if we, if you, if you consider a law based on a hypothetical versus what's actually happening in the country, you know, I think, I think you have to decide where you want to be there. Um, Carl. You're saying there's no place, I mean, even though you're from New York, yeah. there's no place in Vermont where you could have the child uh, aborted because of the conditions that that's described? Uh, I, I believe that's simply because the, um, the there, there's only four physicians that are taking um, patients much later in pregnancy, which is where we were at 32 weeks by the point we could arrange the health care. Um, so I'm, I'm not aware of whether or not you guys have physicians in the state that treat patients in our in cases like ours from out of state, very late in pregnancy, et cetera. So. Um, Mr. Marshall, I thought part of what you were saying was that, and I might have misunderstood you, is in terms of people who have contacted you who are um, have experienced, have been through this exper a similar experience mm -hmm. um, that people are not always comfortable sharing that, and that there may be someone from Vermont. Absolutely. Um, but that they are not comfortable. What I heard, that, that's how I, 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 I think. I think, you know, again, we, we can't know for sure. I just know that um, based on the numbers, it would stand to reason, you know, th these, these terrible things that happen during pregnancy obviously don't care what state you're living in. So I think that's... That's the issue, um, but in our case, you know. I'm sorry. What did you say? There, that doesn't occur in our state. So. It, it, it it would it would seem. I mean, if it, if it didn't occur in Vermont, um, I think someone would probably write a paper about that. <laughs> but I, I I would I would say that just statistically, you can you could guarantee that it, it's happening. That people are getting you know uh, bad diagnoses in Vermont. And, and they may be traveling to, you know, a clinic in Maryland, a clinic in D.C., a clinic in Colorado, a clinic in New Mexico, um, depending on their circumstances. Or in some cases, um, it may be that people are helping them here. I, I don't know the specifics of your law or, or the cases here. So. Um, um, Carl, um, Sandy just pulled up the um, Vermont Medical Center website, which has um, the Vermont Department of Health, uh, after 21 weeks, 
there were 14 abortions and three then un unknown. So three, there were three unknown in terms of when they happened, but so out of a total of 1,298 um, in terms of that. How one many day, years? What? How many years was that? This is one year. This one is year. one year 20, in 2016. During the office, if I could just follow up on that. That's My point was not necessarily the number, but based on the situation he's talking about, it would seem that currently in Vermont, he would have been allowed or his wife to have an abortion. But uh, what I'm hearing is that he thinks probably not. In other words, um, I, 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 don't, I don't know that. He, he doesn't, I don't he doesn't know that. Know that. Doesn't Sorry. Know that. Yeah. Are, I don't know anything about the providers or, or the situations. Um, you know, what we can... Very few, the, what you're saying the, is very Vermont few. Medical, yeah. Vermont Medical Society is very clear that no abortion providers in Vermont perform elective abortions in the third trimester. So I take that as a fact that no um, abortion providers um, in Vermont perform elective abortions. But not in, by in law, the third, by, um, by virtue of their um, eth medical ethics, I presume, right? By their medical ethics and by the um, by the um, procedures and policies of. Um, of the institution. Okay. I, I my might, point was it's not by law, because there yeah. are no prohibitions. Exactly, law. exactly. Um, and I um, I would hesitate to say that the um, experience that Mr. Marshall is talking about was not an elective abortion, in my mind. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know if you, I mean. I, uh, uh, I understand. I, 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 would, I would medically characterize it as elective. Yeah, so would I. But you would medically characterize it as elective. elective. Okay. If so, is, if your wife was. If it is not to immediately save the person's life, my understanding is that that's that's what constitutes the notion of elective. Okay. So, uh, but again, I'm not a physician or a lawyer. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just curious if, um, in uh, interacting with a lot of these people that have come forward to reach mm -hmm. out since you've put your story out, um, have you? run into, I mean, it's a very anecdotal question, but have you run into people who, um, you know, have made decisions that are, um, you know, less dire or, you know, people who just kind of dis made a decision like at eight or nine months or 32 weeks or whatever, and just like, you know what, I, I'm, I'm not going to go down this road kind of thing. Like, how do you run into people in that category? I've, I've never run into people in that category, nor have I even heard of one anecdotally, but um, I would also note that I'm not sure that any of the current practicing providers would even provide that type of care. Um, in our case, you know, while we had, you know, the, the, the doctor that we saw in Colorado had had, had um, conversations with our physician in New York, so they, they had our medical records, et cetera, but still he himself did an ultrasound to confirm the findings of, of our doctor um, in terms of the, the high amniotic fluid, et cetera, the, the growth. And so he, he made his own independent determination on what was happening in the pregnancy before he would be willing to move forward. Um, so again, like I, I think that these physicians are often characterized as, as freewheeling, like, if you have the money, I'll do it. It's not a thing. Um, there, to my knowledge, there's no provider in the country that is makes these decisions lightly, um, and and their accounts are you know have been published in, in various various stories. Yeah. And thank you for clarifying that um, you believe that the experience that you went through would be characterized as an elective yeah. um, abortion. Mm -hmm. And I would say that very few of the ones that I that I understand would would be characterized otherwise. I've heard a few where it, it is immediately to save the person's life, but I, but a, lo a lot of them have to do with a poor fetal diagnosis um, that then risks health, which is not necessarily elective. So my understanding was elective meant the life of the mother was compromised, but also like the child most likely wouldn't survive, but that's not, not your understanding. I, I mean, that. if. Again, I again I'm not a lawyer or physician, sure, but sure. it's my understanding that 
um, that elective is, you know, you, you are electing to get a procedure, you, you could carry that pregnancy to term and roll the dice in terms of your own health, but, but you know, it, it is not, I, I, I think a lot of times people um, choose to get a procedure to end pregnancies like that for their mental health, frankly. Mm -hmm. um, I know that that was certainly part of our, you know, the, the idea of having to carry a, a doomed fetus for, for, you know, weeks and weeks was, that sounded terrible to me. Um, and I didn't want that for my wife. Because it, I'm sorry, I'm, yeah. just, I'm having a picture of a woman who is eight months pregnant. And I know I am bad about that. I see people who are yeah. eight months pregnant, and I have to make sure I don't tap their stomach or go, how exciting, when's, it, when's your baby due? Um, yeah, in our case, when we had to fly to Colorado, that happened on the way there. It was a couple of days off of Mother's Day, and people kept congratulating us on the baby and asking if it was our first, and did we have a name, and did we know if it was a boy or girl? Mm -hmm. So again, that's the thing. Pregnancy is such a public thing in our culture that I think that um, we, we have to own up to what we're asking these people to go through if we're demanding that they continue a pregnancy in these situations. Mr. Marshall, thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Thank you for um, sharing a very private story yeah. um, to help us in our deliberation on the, an issue that is very hard. Yeah. And I, I would urge you, if you have a moment uh, at some point while considering this, um, to look at abortionpatients.com, very simple, abortionpatients.com. Mm -hmm. um, that's the open letter. Um, that we organized from patients who've had to terminate after 20 weeks um, in sort of in response to some of the rhetoric that we've been hearing and mischaracterizations that we've been hearing around the procedure. So. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have myself. Um, and um, <coughs> um, for young, <coughs> um, welcome. Well, thank you. Thank you. And um, may I ask, do you have anything? I do, and I, I have brought copies too, in case you did not well, get them. Uh, we have it online, and okay. we have two people on either side of you who can pull it up on the if we have if we, yeah. <laughs> okay. We're a little behind. <laughs> no problem. It's on. And I, I apologize, did I, um, how do you pronounce your name? Board Gang. A Board Gang. Yes. Sorry. Thank you. Good morning. Um, uh, again, my name is Bo Yang, and I am the executive director of the Vermont Human Rights Commission. Thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to speak today um, in support of Age 57. Um, for those of you who don't know, the Human Rights Commission is a state agency that has jurisdiction over complaints of discrimination in housing, in state government employment, and in places of public accommodations. And places of public accommodations is a really large spectrum. That includes schools, hospitals, roads, prisons. Um, it is, in fact, like really a, a significant portion of the work that we do at the Human Rights Commission. Um, all, three very important categories is sex, <laughs> breastfeeding, and pregnancy accommodations that uh, we cover. Um, a woman who has the right to an abortion um, could bring a claim of discrimination if that right is impeded, um, it, certainly at the federal level and both in the state of Vermont. Uh, the Human Rights Commission strongly believes and affirms that the right to an abortion is a fundamental human right. Um, and so we absolutely support H57. 
Um, ideally, having a constitutional amendment giving women the right to an abortion is um, the best way to ensure that that, that right remains in place. And I know that the Senate is um, looking at a, a similar <coughs> bill. Um, but right now, and uh, we would encourage that the most important thing is um, passing legislation um, ensuring that right immediately. Um, we, in the, the written testimony. I'm sorry, you said something about an amendment. What was the amendment? Oh, the Senate is proposing uh, a similar bill that could potentially uh, make a constitutional amendment, yeah, okay. ensuring the right to an abortion. And we would encourage the House to consider such a thing as well. Um, currently, California, Connecticut, Delaware, Hawaii, Maine, Maryland, Nevada, Oregon all have laws in place um, ensuring the right to an abortion. Oregon's law, which was enacted in 2017, is probably the most comprehensive. Um, and it was, it's called the Reproductive Health Equity Act. Um, and it requires insurers to cover, with no cost to the patient, the entire gamut of reproductive treatment. Um, contraception, vasectomies, prenatal care, along with abortion, postnatal care, and screenings for cancer, as well as sexually transmitted diseases. Um, ideally, the Human Rights Commission would support um, a bill just like Oregon's. Uh, one of the greatest barriers to abortion is the cost. And we know that um, that impediment um, impacts women of color um, and women who are of lower socioeconomic status. Um, and these are issues that are really important at the Human Rights Commission, and I imagine would be important to you as well as legislators. And I have included here um, uh, what the coverage is at each of these states that have considered it. I don't want to um, spend too much time on that unless you'd like me to go through that. Um, but we know that currently there are many states that are looking at the right to abortion or banning the right to abortion. Um, and so it's very important that the state of Vermont uh, really sets the precedence and is at the forefront of this fight to ensure women's rights. Thank you. Any questions? Question. Um, if Roe versus Wade was overturned um, and we passed the bill here in Vermont, um, so nationally it was not, you, you, you couldn't do it. Am I understanding what you just said? No. So, you know, when the federal government passes a law, right. it can do one of two things. It can have a, a law that is prohibits something from happening, right. or it could just be a law that overturns the right to something. So if Roe versus Wade is overturned, the federal government isn't really making a decision that it is now criminal yeah. to conduct an abortion. It really is just saying that law, that right is no longer uh, protected or observed at the federal level, but each state would still have the ability to create more protective laws and ensuring that right. So unless we actually see like the federal government passing an act that makes it criminal in nature, then we wouldn't have that competition between the state and the federal law. So this, if the Roe versus Wade is overturned and the state of Vermont does not do anything, then you are essentially leaving women without any right to an abortion. But if you enact this statute and Roe versus Wade is overturned, that still ensures the rights of women um, in the state of Vermont. And we're not likely to see the federal government pass a law making abortion criminal in nature. Yeah. So that kind of- So if there's no law against it nationally, and there's no law against it locally, is there any reason why a woman can't get an abortion if it's needed? Well, if you don't have any laws in place, whether at federal level or at the state level, right. then you have a situation where uh, you could have um, clinicians not to, making a choice not to provide it. You could potentially have employers not allowing someone to take time off uh, for medical reasons to find an abortion. You could have people going out of the state. Um, and I, I would say not having any laws in place is probably a very bad idea um, because you want to guarantee that right to women. Um, and also you want to protect clinicians um, in the state of Vermont who are providing it, and you want to protect women from discrimination and employment and in places of public accommodations if they choose 
to uh, both again if they choose to have an abortion or they choose to have a child. Um, so the law is protective in both ways, really. It isn't just the right to an abortion; it's also the right to have a child as well. Carl, uh, the, the Civil Rights Commission uh, does. Do they recognize that the unborn child has any rights or not? Uh, it's the Civil Rights Commission. Uh, that's all I'm asking. Human, the Human, Human, Rights Human, Rights Human Rights Commission. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. So Human I'm Rights asking Commission. if if you recognize any rights of the unborn. Um, so our protected categories are is sex discrimination, breastfeeding, and then pregnancy accommodation falls within um, sex discrimination. So there isn't a um, specific language as to the rights of unborn. Um, fetuses or children or whatnot, but it's sort of subsumed in sex discrimination claims. Um, that isn't to say that we don't take a position on that, which is why I'm here really, is we do absolutely believe that it is a fundamental right, but it's not spelled out in the statute. Yeah. You, you, you also said that um, people of color are discriminated against because it costs so much to have an abortion. Um, can, can you explain to me why you singled out people by, of color? Yeah, uh, well, I, I, I didn't mean to single that out, uh, other than to say that um, we definitely know that cost to have an abortion is um, can prohibit many women. And we know that there are statistics out there that show that um, women of color and all persons of color tend to be on the lower socioeconomic level. I think um, Carrie Brown from the Commission on Women provided a really thorough um, written testimony um, on the connections between economics and the right to abortion. And we absolutely like support that. Uh, there is a connection between the right to have control over your body and the ability to go to work. Uh, we see that uh, up until this point, some, a lot of the concerns has been um, regarding women who want to have children in the workplace. And that's often the things that we're re looking at is you want to have the time off or the paid time off or you want to um, have the preg pregnancy accommodations. So we know that that absolutely is connected to um, uh, reproductive rights. Um, but we have never had to consider uh, a woman who is leaving the workplace to have an abortion or an employer who might disagree with a woman's choice to have an abortion. Um, and that's something that we are potentially facing if we don't have a law in place to ensure that. And so in Vermont, that's all I care about right, right. now, in Vermont, when you, so the, the statement about women of color, mm -hmm. um, last time I checked now, I, I, I don't know exactly, but there are more people that aren't of color in Vermont. Right. It, even if there's one, it doesn't make any difference, but I, it just intrigued me that you use that term to try to convince me that um, that was a major problem in Vermont. Well, okay, so <laughs> let me just take a step back. This is, that just happens to be, we can, at the Human Rights Commission have jurisdiction not only over sex discrimination claims, but also discrimination claims on behalf of people who are uh, persons of color, uh, as well as individuals who are from different national origins. And because that is also within our jurisdiction, I thought it was also important to point out that this isn't just a women's rights issue, this also impacts women of color as well. Nationally, um, the fact that the state of Vermont is majority white doesn't really, I think, make it any more or less compelling. I um, realize that. Yes. Say that? I'm sorry. I, I said I realize that. Yeah. That, that's, that's the way I'm looking at this. Sure. There's no, no discrimination. There's, I'm not thinking of that at all. I'm thinking of a woman. Right. Period. But um, in, in terms of costs and costs of abortion being potentially prohibitive, I think it's important to note that women of color tend to make less money and that if this House is interested in passing this bill, in the future we would consider language or we would be supportive of language 
or terms that support some insurance coverage or um, any kind of sort of appropriation or money related to that. Um, that was the context of costs. Yeah. So, so ins insurance companies do not cover abortion at all? Um, we don't have any laws in place. I don't know if I can speak directly to what insurance companies do or can't do, but we don't have any laws in place that would sort of ensure that. Yeah. I don't think I'm the best person to answer the question about insurance. Okay. Thank you very much. Are there other um, questions? Carl? Just, I mean, you talk about the uh, Commission on Civil Rights. So let, let's say a husband did not want his wife to terminate a pregnancy. Do you get involved in any of those situations? In other words, his civil right is being challenged by by the right to abortion. Yes. So do you, how, how would your organization deal with something like that? Uh, so again, our the Human Rights Commission um, handles cases of discrimination. Um, and um, that particular situation is one in which that man, that husband, is not a protected individual under our statute. So I only operate under the confines of our statute. So I wouldn't have the ability to interfere in that situation, to even bring a claim in that situation, to investigate a situation like that. We strictly in investigate and litigate claims of discrimination, yes. And he would not be a protected individual under our statutes. By yeah. our Vermont statutes. Uh, right? By the Vermont Human Rights oh, statute. Right. Human yeah. Rights yes. Oh. How would a uh, Down syndrome individual be treated under the civil rights? So, uh, civil rights right. so under the Vermont Human Rights Protected Group? Under the Vermont Human Rights statute, an individual with Down syndrome could have a disability claim. Right? If they were claiming that they were dis because of their disability, they were discriminated against in housing, in places of public accommodations, or in state government employment, they are a protected individual because they have a disability. So an individual with Down syndrome who applies for a job and is qualified and is not picked for that job um, because of their disability would have, could be, bring a claim at the Human Rights Commission. Likewise, if they walked into a store and the store said, we don't want people like you in here, they could bring a claim of public accommodations discrimination at the Human Rights Commission. So it is because they're connecting that discrimination to the basis of their disability. But if I could just, mm -hmm. could I just pursue a little Absolutely. bit more about yes, please. what you said about when I asked, uh, does, do the unborns have, uh, do the unborn have any rights? And you said a lot of things pretty much about what you cover and not cover, but you never said affirmatively or, or non-affirmatively, I guess, of whether the Civil Rights Commission believes that the unborn have any rights. No one has ever brought a claim at the Human Rights Commission on behalf of an unborn child. Uh, so I cannot speak to that. And our statute specifically does not define that you have to be born or unborn, because every individual that has ever brought a claim has been born. We do have claims on behalf of minor children um, that parents or guardians bring. Um, and certainly, sometimes they do have disabilities. but. Again, I work under the confines of the Vermont Human Rights Statute, and thus far, that claim has never been brought. And it is nowhere spelled out in our statute. So I hope that clarifies that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And are there other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you for coming. Thank, Thank you. So, um, so yeah. I, would, I would like to point out um, just for general information, mm -hmm. um, if insurance companies cover. Okay, I will, I will um, do a little research and see if I can get that Thank answer. You. Thank you. Um, between, them in the lot, right, right. I, will, I will see what um, I can do um, in terms of that, like, you know, now. But right now we have, um, unless people want, we have some time to stretch our legs and walk around and at 11 o'clock um Jillian and Claire is coming to talk about um, opi um 
opioids. Uh, but is there anything that people wanted before we um, break want to talk about? I'm, I guess I'm just surprised that the Commission on Civil Rights. It's human rights. Human rights. Human rights. Human rights. Okay. Human All right. Human human rights. Rights. HRC. Did not have a, a position on that. But anyway, so she answered it well. I mean, given her situation. Yeah, I mean, she was clear about what yeah. the statute covers. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.